This is the second of three lectures on the life of El Haj Omar by Mamadou Aliou Tiam, who is a or was a, a Fulani, a Tukuler Fulani poet who wrote an ode or a kasada to the life of El Haj Omar Tal. Uh, probably, if you're coming to this one, uh, be better off going back to listen to the first lecture. The first lecture covers. Uh, tells you a little bit about the lie about the uh, uh, Tukuler Falani in Futa Torah, Futa Jalon, and uh, gives you some background on the life of El Haj Omar and takes you through the Kasada up to the point where El Haj Omar returns from his pilgrimage to Mecca. In this lecture, we'll discuss the uh, the his growing fame in the Futa Torah and the Futa Jalon and discuss certain aspects of his character and the character of his talibs. And then in the third lecture in part three, we'll look at the sectarian conflict or the civil war that broke out between the Messina Fulani who were Kadria, led by Amadou Amadou, the son of Sekou Amadou in what is today central Mali and Al Haj Omar Tal, who was Tukuler and Tijani who brought his talibs from the Futa Torah and the Futa Jalon entrance into central Mali. So, um, as you can see here again, just to review very quickly, this was uh, this is a casada of uh, up to, of uh, 1,200 excuse me 1,200 verses. The the most uh, most of the Arabic casadas are go between 2,000 no more than 2,000 to 3,000 verses. It was edited and translated by Henry Gadden and published in 1936. Uh, it was written in a Jame, which is uh, an African language that's been alphabetized with an Arabic script. In this case, the script was the was Pular. So this is an African language literature, although alphabetized with an Arabic script. It is an African literature, and it was intended also to be, although it's written, it's also intended to be performed. So it's a performative piece as well. It is it is an effective poem although I've translated it here as a prose poem. Um, I, I would note again, this is intended, this lecture and the other two lectures are intended for those who are not that familiar with the cultures of West Africa and Islamic culture, Sufi culture. And so I am reviewing certain basic aspects of these cultures for those who are not familiar with uh, the literature and culture of this region. Again, as you can see here in the center, there is the place where El Haj Omar's empire was established. Although if you look to the left in the Futa Torah towards the, the, the left, the high left corner, you can see Podor. That's where he came from, where he was born in Alwar in the, in the region of Podor. And then Dingari, south of there in the Futa Jalan is the, uh, was, was the place where he first, the village that he first built and established as, his, as he was consolidating his followers around him before going into, uh, into what is today central Mali in the Segu Messina region with his talibs. Um, okay, so, but putting it in a historical context, so as we said in the last lecture, uh, El Haj Omar is now 50 years old. He's been gone for 20 years on his pilgrimage to Mecca, start, stopping in various parts of West Africa, including Sokoto, where he consolidated his friendship and alliance with Muhammad Bello. Uh, in the meantime, as you can see, the San Louis region, and then also San Louis itself on the far uh, left, that's where uh, the French had begun to build their stronghold. And you can see images of San Louis when the architecture is very similar to the architecture of New Orleans in, in the United States. It's French colonial architecture and the French had built Saint Louis on an island right off the coast of Senegal because they could fortify it and, and protect it. It's during this time, however, during the life of El Haj Omar that the French began to become more ambitious and rather than being located on, on the coast, they want to now to try to penetrate into the interior. And it's this this is forms the historical context of El Haj Omar's jihad as well, because there is a sense in which it is a, his jihad was also a reaction against French imperialism. 
And so this is also why he's perceived by many to be a, a fighter against colonialism or someone who fought colonialism, but d decided that, he, that, the, that the case was lost in his native Futa Torah, Futa Jalan, and so went even deeper into, uh, into the parts of uh, West Africa that had not traditionally been the homeland of, of the Tukulair. The, uh, the French colonial administrator at this time was in a general was uh, Louis Leon Césaire Fader, appropriately named Caesar. You can see he lived here from 1818 to 1889. Uh, he was the one who headed the transition between the French being simply a, a kind of a coastal power um, in, in the, uh, and, and trying to get deeper into the interior. The plan of 1854 was a, a plan for empire, for the growth of the French empire, and it was Fade Herb that administered that. The, uh, he and El Haj Omar, or the Talibs of El Haj Omar anyway, came into direct conflict in what's called the Battle of Medina in 1857. This was the only time that the French and the Tukulair under El Haj Omar's leadership came into direct uh, conflict. But Fayed Harb is, uh, was, was, the, was the key figure behind this French push to get deeper into West Africa, which is also what, if, what in, in, is in the backdrop that fuels this effort on the part of El Haj Omar to, to, to leave lands controlled by the French or that are under French colonial hegemony. Here's what Henry Gadden notes. He was again the translator and the editor of, of Tiam's uh, Casada. And in one of his notes, he, he, meant, he, he clarifies, he says, the Sheikh passed through Bakal in 1847, where he was well received by the commandant of the French outpost, Monsieur Hekar. At this time, Umar announced to Hekar that he would be returning soon to wage holy war against the infidels of this land and require them to submit to Islam. El Haj Omar, uh, Gadden tells us, did not therefore hide his intention to conduct holy war in the region. He had brought a viable army with him to the Futa, where he also enlisted many key recruits, such as Alpha Umar Tierno Bala, his closest collaborator, Alpha Umar Tierno Mole, and many others. So, uh, so, the, so the French, you know, he, he, he made no bones about it. He, he told the French what he was going to do, but uh, the French weren't that concerned at this point because his holy war was going to be conducted against, you know, the, the so-called heathen or animus. But they, they were keeping an eye on him, and, uh, and he did inter interact with them, and they were very concerned that, uh, of the potential for El Haj Omar to, uh, to revolt against them. And in fact, El Haj Omar wrote a letter to the people of the Futa. Now, not this was not widely, this was not something that that he. I mean, this was something he kept from the French. But in his letter, uh, that is later surfaced, he wrote, "Make war upon the people who believe neither in God nor His Prophet about those things that are forbidden to us, or who, after receiving a revelation, the Jews and the Christians, or the people, so-called peoples of the book, choose not to follow the true religion until they agree to pay the, the jizya or the religious tribute by force and are thereby humbled. As for you, children of Nadar, Saint Louis, God forbids you to consult, consort with them. He made clear to you that all those who consort with them are infidels like them, saying, you, are not, you will not live pell-mell with Jews and Christians. So this is in, you know, in the Quran there, the Quran has, you know, different surahs that speak about the appropriateness of living among Jews and Christians. And he's citing the surahs that, uh, that, that say that one should not live, if you're Muslim, one should not live among Jews and Christians, they are acknowledged as peoples of the book or that the revelations that they received was legitimate, but because they don't con uh, choose to convert to true, uh, the true religion or the so-called true religion, Islam, they are, um, they are forced to pay a tax. And uh, part of what he, he's suggesting here is what's problematic about the French uh, who, are, who are mostly Catholic Christians, although there were some Jews among the French as well. But in any case, neither were paying any tribute uh, and this was also disturbing to El Haj Omar. So he urged the people of the Futa, the Futa Torah, and the Futa Jalan to separate themselves 
from the French. So again, here you can see the Futa Torah, uh, Toro, excuse me, and the Futa Jalon. Uh, uh, and you can see where Dingari on the map, where he was to later establish his empire. Uh, and then later Karta, which he took to the north, was one of the early uh, lands that he conquered on his jihad. And then Segu, which was the capital of the Bambara, the Bamana kingdom uh, there. It was an animist empire. And then Hamdalai, uh, where the Messina Fulani, Seku Amadu, and then his son uh, Amadu Amadu, uh, resided, who he was to later get into a conflict with. Now, these this map gives you a pretty good indication of, of the key areas, but you can see if you look to the in the Futa Torah to the far uh, left by the coast, this is where Saint Louis was. And so, as the French penetrate deeper and deeper into uh, the Sahel, this pushes El Haj Omar to go uh, the other direction because he did not want to live under French political hegemony. He wanted to establish a kingdom or an empire that would be uh, ruled by Sharia or Islamic law. It would be free from this, uh, what he saw as an oppressive colonial, French colonial presence. Um, so, all right, this is now, and remember uh, that when Hajj Omar went to Mecca, he, uh, you know, he was authorized by Muhammad al Ghali to conduct jihad, but it, it, in, in, in a formal sense, but he has not yet received uh, authorization to launch his jihad. So, in effect, he knew that it was okay for him to conduct jihad even when he was in Mecca, but he was not ready to begin his jihad quite yet. And so, this is the period that we're discussing in the Qasada where he is, uh, he's consolidating his talibs, he's consolidating his power, and many, many people are being drawn to him and, and being drawn to the teachings of, of the Tijani that he's initiating uh, the people into who prior to this point were largely Kadria, the ones that were Muslim. And so uh, Tiam tells us, the Sheikh traveled on horseback to the Futa, for he found there true friends who bore him no hostility. He preached of the eternal rewards in store for the good and the eternal damnation that awaited the wicked. The Sheikh initiated the people of the Futa into all the words and dickers. He withheld nothing from them. In return, the people of the Futa swore they would be faithful until the day of their deaths. They swore to never break their oaths to him. So this is, this is prior to his jihad. It's at the end, his, 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 uh, his hajj has ended, and although he drew talibs or followers during the time of his hajj, particularly as he returned uh, and, was in, and spent time in Sokoto and made his way back to the Futa Toro, now he's seriously drawing more and more people to him, and uh, the, 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 the local people, the Futa Toro fellow, Tukuler, Apol, or Falani, are very excited about this new teaching that he's brought to them and, and he has he's become an inspiration for many as he was indeed a very charismatic figure. Uh, a great mass of people left their homes, Tiam tells us, and followed our Sheikh. This included Tiam himself. Uh, they renounced their mothers and fathers on the Sheikh's behalf. They preferred instead the pleasures of paradise. The men of Dingare, this was the, the uh, city that or village that Tal established, uh, were all born of the same generation. They came from the same lands. They had given up all that they knew and loved. They had renounced their own mothers and fathers. They had abandoned the customs and habits of their native land. The Sheikh taught these men until they fully grasped all aspects of the true faith. They learned their responsibilities to the heavenly light that now guided them. And here's uh, Reichardt. Now, this was a very. This is not the text of Tiam, uh, but this this gives us a little supplemental information. This was one of the early texts uh, that tells us. It doesn't tell us much about uh, Al Haj Omar's jihad, but it does tells us what happened prior to the jihad. It's very much worth the read. It's also in the archive of the Marian Tijani text. Uh, but uh, this this little anecdote I wanted to include because it gives you a sense of how important books were to El Haj Omar and, uh, and how he was very much a writer himself. And so we're told in this text that before he or El Haj Omar built the town of Dingare, there had been a terrible fire in the town of Junginko and three houses full of El Haj Omar's books were burnt. When he saw this, El Haj Omar was deeply grieved, wishing 
that he had been burned in the fire instead of his books. The house where many of his own goods were stored was also burnt. But this event did not grieve him. He only grieved when he saw the three houses with his books burning down. As the fire still raged, El Hajj went inside one of his houses and refused to come out. The people entreated him to come out, but he refused. El Hajj said, why should I come out now, now that all my books are burned to a cinder? Right now, so he was, he was a true book lover. And uh, remember, at this, this was about this during this era, in terms of if you think of it in terms of a commodity, a book was about the, worth about the price of a of a human life, or you could a book was traded for a, a, the life of a slave. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, it, and not that those kinds of trades often took place. And so, um, you know, this, these were handwritten manuscripts. And so this this was a terrible loss. And some of these were books that he himself wrote. Uh, the people continued to exhort him, but El Hajj still refused to come out. When the people saw the rising flames surrounding the house, a disciple named Amadou Yeru entered the house and took the sheikh by force. He threw him over his back and said to him, you were the one who wrote many of these books. If it is God's will, you will live to write others. And El Hajj replied, what you say is true, but you will never again find books like these in this land. After that, El Hajj trusted in God. Then he sent a vast sum of money and paper with his brother's son to Timbuktu to have new books made. Later, he left uh, Jungenko and relocated to Dingare. So you get a sense here of how important books were to him. And um, and also, uh, you know, he this this he wasn't he wasn't a mere, you know, book collector. He was he was a true lover of books as were the people of Timbuktu. So this is again, yet you know, more evidence of what a profoundly literate culture this, this really was. Now, uh, El Haj Omar would have written and, and he wrote in Arabic, but he also wrote in Ajami. So Arabic literacy and Ajami literacy is, is very high at this time. Uh, because, and this is certainly going to be true in the case of the Muradiya later uh, under uh, Amadou Bamba. Um, so, okay, so there you see Dingare, on the map, uh, it's towards the center below Bamako. This was the, the city, the village that he built, where he established a mosque and began to consolidate his, uh, his followers. Uh, he built it right in the middle of an animist uh, land uh, by Tamba, which was a kingdom that was uh, ruled by an animist king named Yimba. And in, and in fact, uh, he was effectively a renter of Yimba and Yimba was a pretty crafty uh, figure, uh, and uh, he at first tolerated uh, El Haj Omar being on his land, but uh, he, he later became more and more worried as more and more followers began to, uh, to, to, to come to Dingare, and, and uh, Yimba began to feel that he had made a grave mistake by allowing El Haj Omar to establish himself there. And so he began to try to pick a fight with him. Now, at this time, remember, El Haj Omar has not yet launched his jihad. He, he, he's been told by Muhammad Al Ghali that he can conduct jihad should he want to, but he's, but he's, um, you know, he, he's simply consolidating his talibs. There's no clear objective at this time to to launch his jihad, but uh, but he, um, he he's then attacked by Yimba. And uh, when he's attacked by Yimba and Yimba's animist or heathen, as he would think of them, followers, El Haj Omar is is essentially at this time he, he he conducts a war with Yimba, but it's it's mostly a war of of self defense. It's not until after his conflict with uh, with with Yimba and the king of Menyan who lives nearby, that who's also an animist. That, that he receives his final sort of divine authorization and his holy war or his jihad is, is launched in earnest. Um, here is an image of the mosque that El Haj Omar built at Dingare. This is in, in modern day Guinea today, at this time in the Futa uh, Jalan. And uh, it's, it's, it remains an important center for the uh, Umarian Tijani. So here's what, uh, what we're told by uh, uh, Tiam in the Kasada. He says, the Sheikh tried to make a treaty with Yimba, but his true goal was to distract him and win more time while his army grew in strength. 
Soon the sheikh would have the means to attack this infidel who refused to convert. But Yimba grew even more bloated with pride. You know, Yimba, like I said, he's quite a character. He thought he was invincible. He knew little of the sheikh's true nature. He had not reckoned on the worth of this savant who was prepared for every contingency. You know, but at one point, you know, Yimba told, I mean, basically what happened was Sheikh Umar, uh, his, his men intercepted a shipment of rifles that were bound for Yimba and they, they kept them. And this made Yimba very, very angry. And Yimba sent his men with the sack and told him to bring back the head of El Haj Omar in, in this sack. Uh, now, much of this again, and in the version of Tiam, the, the conflict with Yimba is abbreviated. You can find a fuller version of that conflict or story uh, that has much more details in the story of the Sheikh Al Haj Omar, a native of the Futa Toro. In, in a, this was also a, a, a Jame a text that was translated from the Pular by Charles Augustus Ludwig Reichhardt. And this was. Um, published in 1876. This is one of the earliest of the texts about El Haj Omar to get back to, uh, to, to Europe. So now Yimba was a fetisher. He was, he was an animist. Uh, now in, in, the, in the translation of the text that I'm presenting here, the word, you know, uh, fetisher, uh, animist is the word, uh, or pagan, uh, I'm using the word heathen instead. Uh, which I think is, uh, I mean, it's obviously a pejorative term, but this is this is the way in which Al Haj Omar and his followers saw the animus, and and their goal was to uh, was to again sweep clean the the lands of these uh, you know uh, fetishers who practiced a form of idolatry that Al Haj Omar was not. Uh, you know, he, he felt was a sinful. Now there in the middle, you see an image of a vulture. You know, the Yimba was such a a character and a tyrant uh, that uh, there there were all kinds of stories about him. One of the stories was that he would he would sacrifice his own slaves in order to feed the vultures of of his kingdom. So he was quite a fearsome uh, character, but he was also uh, a fetisher and animist and hostile to the Islamic religion. Uh, when okay, so Tiam tells us when Yimba's army arrived. They showed real bravery. They were resolute and confident, but they were soon put to flight. From dawn until dusk, the heathen who rejected Allah were massacred. The evildoers who refused to convert could only lament and grind their teeth. And of course, we're getting this from Tiam's uh, perspective. Uh, no one knows how many of Yimba's people died that day. Some of his people died outside the walls of the town. Some died in the bush. They were, there were so many dead bodies that it was impossible to count them all. Some of Yimba's people tried to return the same way that they had come, but they found back, back to Tamba, but they found it did them no good. There was no going back for these wretched heathen, Tiam tells us. They were cursed. Not very many of our own people died that day, but the handful of Fulani who were killed gained numerous benefits and eternal rewards. And as we're going to see, El Haj Omar promised his followers who died in, in militant uh, conflicts that they would have a place in, uh, in paradise. And Tiam is a, is a fervent believer that this is so. About a hundred of their people were taken prisoner, Tiam tells us. Yimba uh, at last said after this happened that he would repent. He promised he would convert. But no one believed him. You know, Yimba was very, he was quite the politician. He always spoke out of both sides of his mouth, uh, a, a, not, a lot like uh, our politicians today. Uh, when the sheikh's men spoke with Yimba, they could see that he wasn't uh, sincere. And so they broke off all discussions with him. The sheikh's men gathered up the prisoners. They refused to give these captives or slaves back to Yimba. Instead, they bought, brought them back to Dingare, where they were divided and distributed as slaves among the people. So now note this was a time that, that those taken captive by El Haj Omar, uh, the women were often uh, divided up among the Talibs, the, uh, the men were often beheaded, the children and women sometimes were sold as slaves. And so this was a period of, uh, that, that, that Islam does provide for slavery and, and the Talibs, the followers of Al-Hajj Omar, had 
uh, including El Haj Amar himself, were owners of slaves. Now, this this is a controversial issue, uh, and uh, if you're interested in exploring this further, we can only hear talk about this in passing. But I but I would urge you to watch a wonderful uh, film on this topic uh, by the uh, the father of African cinema, Simbane Usmani, who is Senegalese, called Chado, published or excuse me, uh, uh, produced in 19. 19- 77. This is available, uh, widely available. You can find it on YouTube. And uh, this is this film deals with the very dynamic that uh, El Hot that we're talking about here with respect to the question of slavery. And so, uh, again, it's a very sensitive topic. This film was uh, banned uh, in, by Leopold Sadar Senghor in Senegal for, I think, three or four years before it was finally allowed to be. Uh, you know, released on, on, on false, uh, you know, it was on, you know, it was, he said it was a, a related to the spelling of the title, but it was clearly related to the very, very sensitive matters that were being discussed in this film. Now, in the image on the right, you can see the, uh, the, the, the uh, jihadist that, and this, the figure in the middle there is a, uh, is, is a, is a, a, he was cast as a very Arab looking man, and again, remember the Fulani are, are black Arabs. And so many of the jihads were indeed uh, led by the, the Fulani. And so in, in this film, you, you, one of the interesting dynamics that you see is that the, when, when the Muslims would get into conflict with the so-called heathen, oftentimes the heathen were sold uh, to the French in exchange for rifles. And this enabled the then the Muslim uh, the Muslims to empower themselves in a, in a militant sense, and it put the so-called heathen or pagan animus in a very difficult situation because then they they would have because they didn't have the uh, the military firepower that that the Muslims did, and so they would have to then even consider sometimes selling their own people in order just to protect themselves, to get rifles from the French. And so this, this is also a, a, an interesting example uh, that what this dynamic shows is how even though the French did not themselves capture the slaves, they often fueled the fires by providing you know rifles in order to facilitate the slave trade that then they could take the slaves and then send them to the Americas in exchange for rifles. And this film deals with that. I urge you to watch it. It's wonderful. Uh, Asimbe Nusmani is a wonderful uh, filmmaker. It's a difficult, dealing with a difficult theme, but a, but a, but a wonderful film. Um, all right, so uh, here's Tiam on what happened in this conflict between El Haja Mar Nyimba and uh, uh, Bandigu, who, who was Bandigu, who was a, uh, the king of Menyan, who was also an animist, who sided with Yimba against El Haja Mar. Both of them lost. Uh, Yimba hatched a plot to escape to Minion. This is after he had lost. He was going to run off to to get protection from this from the king of Minion, uh, Bandiugu, who who was an animus like himself. Uh, yet once there, he planned to betray uh, Bandiugu, the chief of Minion, and seize power in Gufti. So he, he wanted to become. You know, he he was again. He was his idea was that he would get to Minion and then he would kill the king of Minion and install himself on his throne. Uh, but uh, word of this got back. Uh, this way, he thought he could put an end to his many troubles. Simbara, the son of Bandiugu, learned of Yimba's plot and sent word to his father of the treachery that Yimba planned. And so when they arrived at the village, Bandiugu said to Yimba, listen, in the name of Allah, you and your people will not live to speak of what will happen here today. After killing Yimba, Bandiugu took possession of Yimba's wives and goods. So he, he effectively, what happened is that after uh, Yimba arrived, he, he was separated from his men and he was taken back and literally he was beaten to death in a very brutal way. And, uh, and that, that was the end of Yimba. But this infuriated Sheikh Omar because he had not given permission to Bandiugu to kill Yimba or to take possession of Yimba's wives and goods which uh, he believed belonged to himself and the Talibs. Uh, so the Sheikh sent a message to Bandiugu, listen, you godless heathen who refuses to convert, all the people and goods that you have seized from Yimba belong to me. They are mine by rights. Turn them over to me at once. Bandiugu replied, hold on, Maribu. is uh, It is you now who must listen to me. 
if you have something to say, you want to say it to me, uh, why don't you come and say it face to face? Let's see if you're so bold then. And so Tiam says, the evil king Ben Yugu assembled his warriors without delay. He brought them together and made preparations to attack the army of the sheikh who never committed any injustice. Uh, now, uh, the sheikh uh, and his talibs did made pretty quick work of uh, Bandiyugu and, and you know, the king of Minyan was beheaded. And now uh, he had been completely successful. He was really overwhelmed in some sense by his success. He was at this time more or less fighting a war of self preservation, but now his fame spread throughout all the land because for years the uh, the Fulani or the Pool had, had, had tried to defeat Yim, but they had never been able to do so. The Sheikh had done so, and now uh, everybody knew about him. And this is this was we're now on the cusp of the jihad that, that he would launch. And, and at this point, his Sheikh is formally authorized when he has a dream, and in his dream, uh, uh, Al Tijani uh, appears to him. Now, uh, there, this, this, I'm taking this not from, again, uh, uh, Tiam's Kasada, but from a text entitled The Life of al Haj Omar. It's an Arabic manuscript uh, that Jules uh, Selenek uh, published in, in translation in 1918. This is also included in the archive of the Marian Tijani. One of the, uh, at, this is three, at least three different authors of this text, and one of the authors is uh, El Haj Omar himself, who tells how he received formal authorization to conduct his jihad. This manuscript then later came to be housed in Fez, Morocco, where Al Tijani is Ahmed Al Tijani is buried. Uh, here's what El Haj Omar says, and this is his own language: The heathen attacked us before I had received any explicit order from God to make holy war upon them. This is, of course, Yimba and the king of Minyan. Uh, before this time, the messenger of God, this would be the prophet Muhammad, may peace, uh, may God bless him and save him. And the Sheikh Al-Tijani, may God be satisfied with him, only authorized me to call the heathen to the Islamic faith and to usher them to the right path, leading to God uh, the, the most high. At this time, the messenger of God, the prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and save him, and the Sheikh Al-Tijani, may God be satisfied with him, ordered me to make holy war uh, upon the heathen. In the past, I had refused to fight them until they finally attacked us. I then remembered the just words of God the Most High, authorizing us to fight against our enemies. A holy war is permitted to those Muslims who are oppressed. God made good on his promise and put our enemies to flight. And so now al Haj Omar feels that he is indeed authorized to uh, conduct holy war. And in fact, he has a dream in which the Sheikh Ahmed al-Tijani appears to him. And in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Sufi practices of the Tijani, they often involve a uh, you know, conjuration in which the name of, 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 the, of a person is evoked or, or is uttered to evoke a double of that person. And so when, when Al-Tijani appears in the dream of Al-Haj Omar, much as he appeared in the dream of Muhammad Al-Ghali to authorize Muhammad Al-Ghali to give the final secrets of, of the order to Al-Haj Omar, the, the, the belief is, is that it's not merely just a dream, it's actually an appearance of, of the double of, of the person who speaks in the dream, in this case of Al-Tijani, who provides this authorization to Al Haj Omar, and uh, he says, "This is again the, the words of Al Haj Omar." He says, "A God later, God the Most High revealed to me on the day of Monday. This would have been uh, in uh, translation September 6, uh, 6 eighteen fifty two, after the prayer of Isha, that I was fully authorized to make holy war." At this time, I heard the voice of God cry out to me on three separate occasions. You are authorized to make holy war. You are authorized to make holy war. You are authorized to make holy war. And so here he receives his formal authorization. And so the actual holy war itself, or jihad, is now uh, now launched. And El Haj Omar begins to move deeper in, into the interior, away from French-controlled lands, 
but this takes him into Segu, which is a vassal state of, of Messina, although Animus, it's, it's, uh, they pay taxes. The Segu, Bambara and Segu pay taxes to uh, the Messina Fulani, so this draws him into conflict, not only with the Bambara or the Bamana of Segu, but also uh, the, the, the Messina Fulani, who are Kadria Muslims in Hamdalai. Okay, we're, and we'll talk more about that in the third lecture, but I want here now to just survey a few of the descriptions of al Haj Omar and some of these narratives that come down to us to give us a fuller sense of who he is. Now, these are the three photos of al Haj Omar uh, that, that uh, have uh, survived. You can see there in, uh, in, uh, in the painting on the wall, this is in Senegal, Amadou Bamba appears above the image of, of Sheikh Omar which is uh, below, um, it, you often see these, these images of El Haj Omar in Senegal. It's not something you see as much in Mali, for instance, and this is uh, indicative of, a, uh, of the influence of the modern, of the modern, uh, of the Muridian in, the, in modern times upon the Tijani in, in Senegal. Uh, so this this phenomenon of, of of painting images, which remember in Islam and, and and in some interpretations of Islam, not West African ones, images are uh, forbidden uh, in relation with relation to the second uh, commandment. But these are historical, uh, you know, photographs of Al Haj Omar first as a Haji, he's taking his pilgrimage to Mecca, and then later as as a uh, jihadist. Who is uh, was was very successful uh, for 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 a long time, All right? So here here is Tiam his description of of the sheikh whom he loves dearly. Uh, Tiam says the sheikh was a savant who fully understood everything that he had ever studied. He excelled in the scope and profundity of his comprehension. He always knew exactly what he was talking about. The sheikh had a sharp mind when it came to the many books that he had studied and all the branches of the religious sciences. He was never mistaken in anything. He was of long stride and far from lazy. All his limbs were exceedingly long. He was extremely generous, but not obsessive in his generosity. He was brave in battle and in negotiations, and he never held back from fear. When he addressed the men, he was an eloquent speaker who never stuttered. He was a fearless man who never worried in the presence of his enemies. He did not hold back before the flags of the heathen. He courageously led the way. And so Tiam is, is uh, smitten with the sheikh. He, he loves him. He, uh, he, he he's just uh, adores his, uh, his sheikh. And so the images of him are quite celebratory that come to us in this ode, which is indeed an encomium or a praise uh, poem by its very generic nature. Now here's another description from a follower of, of the Sheikh uh, in, in a, in a uh, European travel log. This is told to um, a gravier by uh, Simba Nade, who was a uh, who, who was another follower loyal to Sheikh Omar. So this gets, this is yet another uh, description. This is also published in, in, in yet a different uh, travel narrative in the archive of the Umari and Tijani for those who want to read the entire version. He says, uh, the Seku or uh, Al Haj Omar always dressed in the simplest fashion. He wore a skull cap that was bordered in white, a modest turban, black shirt and pants, a pale blue booboo and yellow slippers. On his left shoulder, he carried the sword of the Futa and a panya as did all the talibs. Now booboo is the, are the big uh, uh, robes that people wear the big uh, outfits. Uh, this was the sign of all Muslims ready to undertake holy war. He always kept sandalwood at, at hand. This was with Sufi sandalwood. And on other important occasions, he held one of his two batons. Uh, I'll show you an image uh, later of, of the baton of El Haj Omar uh, that has uh, remained uh, in, um, in, the, in the guardianship of the Omarian Tijani of Bandiagara. Those who saw him often remarked that he was extraordinarily handsome. His eyes were expressive, his skin was golden, and his face finely featured. His beard was long, black, and silky. He wore his beard parted at his chin with no mustache. His hands and feet were perfectly shaped. 
He never looked older than 30. No one ever saw him blow his nose, spit on the ground, or sweat. He never gave the appearance of being too hot or too cold. He could go for days without eating or drinking. He never got tired from long walks or from riding on horseback. No one ever saw him taking a nap. His voice was tender and exceedingly pleasant, both up close and at a distance. He never laughed, cried, nor lost his temper. His face was always calm and smiling. He never struck anyone. He treated free men and slaves in the exact same manner, often remarking that all men were the sons of Adam. He never judged anyone on mere appearance and was a champion of justice among his marabouts. So these are, again, very laudatory, celebratory images of him to give us a, a, an interesting glimpse of, of what he may have been like, what it may have been like to encounter him in person. Now, what you see here is a sword. This was recently, this is, you'll find this sword in the Black History Museum in Dakar, this new museum that was just very recently opened, only in the last couple of years. And uh, the, the sword was in the keeping of the French for a very long time. They finally restored it. Um, and there is some debate, uh, there was some debate anyway, uh, among the Tijani in Senegal about the authenticity of this sword. Um, what I, the, the, I think the, the, this I'm speaking generally, but the consensus was, was that this was a sword of El Hajj Omar. I'm not so sure it was the sword, but it was certainly was one of the swords of El Hajj Omar. You can see that on, on display in uh, Dakar. Here also they have some of his slippers that you can find. Um, on, on display as well in the same uh, museum. Here's Tiam's description of the Sheikh. He says, the Sheikh is a vigilant shepherd who brings his flocks to graze in fertile fields. He leads his flock to fields that are ripe for harvest where milk flows in abundance. He is the shepherd of both village and bush. He is the shepherd of horsemen and foot soldiers. He leads all of them like a shepherd leading a herd. He leads them against all those bearing the flags of the heathen. His herd always rushes upon these evildoers without holding back. And so we have this, this interesting uh, metaphor, this comparison of the sheikh with a, a shepherd leading his flock. And so this is how he was uh, thought of, certainly by uh, Tian. When he preached to them, his talents, he reminded them of the rewards that awaited them in paradise and the dangers of eternal damnation. He spoke to them of the life and maxims of the prophet. As the unique one preached, he filled the hearts of the Talibs with aspirations for the next life. He made them realize that the other world should be their true goal, not this one. The elected Talibs who responded to his call were intelligent men who never spoke when they had nothing to say. They wholeheartedly responded to his gentle and pleasing words. They responded to the promise of eternal reward and the threats to religion posed by incorrigible heathenism. That day they swore oaths of their steadfast loyalty to him. The words that he spoke inspired them. So you can see that he, uh, you know, he, he did, you know, make promises to them that if they, uh, if, if they were killed in battle, then they would receive uh, rewards in paradise. And his, uh, you know, he was reputed to be a very, very dynamic speaker who could hold people captive for as long as he chose to, spoke, to speak, excuse me. Now here, here are some descriptions of, of, from Tiam of the Sheikh's Talibs, who he also describes in very uh, celebratory, laudatory terms. Tiam says, these, these men were healthy, courageous, and patient. They were tireless in their assaults upon the flag bearers of the heathen. They were hard men who never weakened in their resolve. They were masters of the double-barreled rifles and horns of power that they wore below their waists. They wielded gleaming and sharp-edged sabers that brought terror into the hearts of the heathen. If you ask me, my good friend, these brave men were all born in the Futa Toro. So he's celebrating the soldiers, the talents of his own uh, you know, uh, part of the Futa that he lived in, was born in. It was these uniquely elected ones who responded to the call of the Sheikh al-Murtata, or the chosen one. 
These men were masters of the double barrel rifles. They wore gleaming sabers and a horn of, pow of powder below their waist. The, and this, these, there would be these, and, and because as a poem, there are refrains that, that repeat themselves throughout. And this was a common uh, refrain that repeated itself throughout the long poem. They were loyal men who never failed to penetrate the enemy's rank. They were originally from the Futa, the land we call Namander. They hunted down all those who denied Allah and put them to death. So here are some early images. You can see that these, these uh, are, are cavalry or horse uh, or, or, or uh, horsemen that are riding horses. And you can see they're wearing the, the signature hat that the Fulani wear. Also, there's a Songhe version of the same hat too. But this, this is a, a hat of, of that you'll also see the Fulani cattlemen wear. They're very powerful hats in, against protecting against the harsh sun and but they are a signature hat of, of the Fulani. Um, this is an image I took at the museum in Dakar uh, in, uh, in uh, the Black History Museum and you can and you can see here if you were to put this uh, if you were to pause this uh, this uh, video and you would you would could then more carefully read the names of all of the the 99 first companions of El Haj Omar those who were uh, loyal to him. Now there were many more than this, but this is the this is the list of those 99 first companions who responded to the call of El Haj Omar Tal. Uh, in the same museum, these are these are some artifacts: a, a saddle, a, a, a war drum, and 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 some other you know some leggings and other you know uh, bags for arrows uh, to carry the arrows. Of, of the soldiers of El Haj Omar Tal. And you can see there behind them, you can see some of the Quranic writing boards, the inscription boards for studying the Quran. Here's Tiami. He says, the Sheikh preached to the Talibs and inspired them to strive for the things of the other world. He implored them to treat this world as little more than an old mat that one rolls up and sets aside when it is no longer of use. He told them, be firm in all that you do. When our two armies meet again and there is nothing that separates the two units, then victory will soon be yours uh, or ours. That day, the sons of the Futa swore oaths to our sheikh that they would never break. The sheikh said to them, on the day that we attack Dayangunti, one of two things will happen. You will easily conquer this village and soon find yourself walking its streets or you will find yourself reclining among the dark-eyed beauties of paradise. So this is so. Either way, it's going to be good for you. He was saying you either we're either going to conquer, or you'll awaken in paradise and you'll be in a better place. Uh, we attacked Dayangunte and easily took it. We destroyed the village and killed all the men. We bound the women with together with ropes. They had no hope of escape. So I, I note here that uh, that that, that Tiam is a very pious. Muslim, but it, it is, I think, from the perspective of many uh, modern readers, it might seem a little disturbing to us the the utter calm with which he describes the uh, the beheading of and killing of, of uh, the enemy and and the enslavement of, of the women and their children who become the captives of of the Talibs. Here's Chum again. The Sheikh promised these men all the happiness of this world and the next. Those who lived in this village are certain to gain forgiveness on the day of the resurrection, for they set their sights in on paradise. He's talking in this case about some of those, because after he would take the village, uh, he would have to leave behind some of his talibs to, uh, to instruct the locals in, in the ways of Islam and, and the Tijaniya. Now, the one time that the Talibs and El Haj Omar came into direct conflict with the French was at a, a fort in, at Medina, a French fort at, at a town called Medina, which is in Mali in the Kaya region. This happened in 1857. This became a very famous incident in the annuals of French colonial history in the region. You can see on the far right a drawing of, of the fort and the Talibs of El Haj Omar had surrounded it for many days. And, and attacked it, and it looked like they were going to, to be victorious until Fade Herb, uh, who, we met, who we talked about earlier, arrived on a boat, and he brought with him many of these horts. So you can see on the far left a horts, 
And, uh, and, and again, this was a matter you know, that the, the French were victorious in this conflict. This was a matter of sheer firepower. Now, I would note that the Talibs uh, had confiscated two of these horitzers. Uh, Tiam refers to these horitzers as the billy goats of the governor. And they brought these horitzers with them. And it gave them a great advantage over the, uh, the heathen whom he attacked. And in the case of, say, in, uh, in, in, in Segu, when, uh, when, when the, and, I, and again, I'm using that word uh, heathen. I'm trying to use it in a, in a non-pejorative uh, sense. It, does, it has a pejorative uh, connotation to it. But this is how this, the Talibs referred to their enemies. And, uh, but, but they had no, the, the advantage that, that, the, that the Sheikh's army had against the Messina Fulani and against the, uh, the, the, the so-called heathen, in uh, in Segu was that they had these two horitzers that they had that the French had left behind. They didn't win them in battle. The French had had to abandon them, and the Talibs came across them, and this gave them a great advantage as they went deeper into the interior. But when Fadeherb arrived on these boats, he brought far more of these so-called billy goats uh, with him, and and the Talibs were simply outmanned. This was this was a very dark moment in the history of, of the sheikh's uh, jihad. A number of his followers uh, abandoned him at this point, and they, uh, they, some believe that his or that the that the uh, that the uh, oracle or the Ishkatara that, that the sheikh consulted had failed him. But uh, El Haj Omar himself said I, he he really had uh, claim anyway that he did not authorize this attack on the fort. That this was something that the Talibs themselves wanted to do without his authorization and so that he himself was angry at the Talibs for having attacked the fort. Now th this was one version of the story. There are different versions of the story, but this is something that the historians uh, contest. Uh, we don't find a whole lot about this uh, incident in Tayyam's um, uh, Kasada. It was, it was a difficult moment, of course, and I'm sure he didn't want to talk too much about it. But it was an important historical incident that I mentioned in passing. The French and Sheikh Omar's uh, uh, fighters came into direct conflict. This caused the Sheikh Omar and his Talibs to go even deeper into the interior to get away from these, these French-controlled lands. And, uh, and, and as he uh, left, he, you know, he realized that he needed more uh, followers, and so he he would he would send Alpha Umar and some of his other Talibs back to the Futa, and he went back himself at one point, and he urged those in the Futa to to come with them and to abandon these lands. Uh, and in some cases, immigration was even forced, as the villages of those who didn't want to immigrate were, were burned by the Talibs. And here's uh, Al Haj Omar saying to those in the Futa in Tayyam's uh, Kasada, he says, Listen, my good friends, you must immigrate. This land is no longer yours, it now belongs to the Europeans. It will turn out badly for all those who live among these people. So, again, he's fleeing, he doesn't want to live under French uh, hegemony. The Sheikh said, Leave this land that has ceased to be yours, it now belongs to the Europeans. It will turn out badly for all those who live among these people. And the people replied, we understand and consent. Those of firm resolve returned to their homes and immediately made preparations to depart. Okay, so Tiam is seeing this, again, th from the eyes of a, of a great supporter of El Haj Omar. Not everybody was of firm resolve, but, but some, you know, many were forced to uh, immigrate, and it was a very difficult march uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to leave their homes and leave everything behind and join with the Sheikh as he was moving further west, uh, uh, excuse me, further east. But, um, but, they, but they did, and, and so he, he, he fortified his, uh, his army. And, and the Futa became, from time to time throughout his jihad, the Futa became a kind of a well from which he would draw. He would go back and continue to get new recruits to help him with the jihad. Uh, he headed toward the Toro and told all those he met, you must immigrate. Don't delay any longer. Leave this land where there is no religion. Leave this land where the Sunnah or the tradition is turned on its head. He told the people, immigrate. This land has ceased to belong to you. It now belongs to the Europeans. It will turn out badly for all those who live among these people. Uh, and then Tiam tells us, those who, consent, who consented 
sold all that they owned and bought beasts of burden to carry their provisions. They packed their bags, they loaded up luggage and headed for the east. So again, you can see there the Futa Jalan where, he's, where he was as, as he began his jihad, moving, he's, now he's moving deeper into uh, the territory of the, the Bambara, the Bamana near Segu. Uh, but at this time, as I said, Segu is a, a vassal state of Messina. Messina looks at it effectively, Amadou Amadou, as, as its territory. And, and, and Messina, Amadou Amadou, does not want uh, El Haj Omar coming into this part of West Africa. He's very concerned. And, this is, and, and so the conflict is beginning uh, to gear up as Amadou Amadou is watching what's happening, as King Ali in Segu is watching what's happening, as, uh, the, as, as the Sheikh and his Talibs are moving deeper into these territories. Now, the first place they go, if you look up um, on, on, the, on the map on the right in the area called Karta in Nioro, this is the first place where they take the, 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 the people of Karta were also uh, Bamana and they uh, were, you know, were effectively relatives who had at one time been part of the uh, king, the Segu kingdom, but had broken off and formed their own kingdom. Uh, the Talibs uh, destroyed this area first and, and made these people their prisoners. And, and then those who didn't, uh, who, who converted, joined the Sheikh in his fight. And, but now he's moving closer to Segu. Messina's watching. It's beginning to heat up quite a lot. As you can see here, are some images. Segu is, is an animist kingdom uh, where uh, tradi very ancient traditional religious practices are, are still preserved. It's located on, on the Joliba or, or the Niger River. And uh, we're moving ever closer into uh, Hamdulai. Now, this image here is uh, an image. I took this image in 2014 in, um, in Jene, uh, not long after the, the conflict between uh, the, that happened in, in central Mali. And uh, this mosque was actually a mosque that Seku Amadou, this is very close to Hamdalai. It's not Hamdalai, but the architecture would have been similar. Much of Ham Hamdalai was destroyed. Uh, Seku Amadou also incidentally destroyed this mosque uh, himself because he believed, because there was prostitution being practiced in the area. And so he, he destroyed it. And then later the French uh, rebuilt it. Uh, and so it's, it's a rebuilt mosque and that looks exactly like the one that existed before Seku Amadou uh, destroyed it. But this, this gives you a sense of what the architecture uh, of, of the area uh, looks like. Uh, again, I, I note that all of these narratives that I've been referencing here and the entirety of uh, Tiam's narrative is in the archive of the Umarian Tijani. You can find it there. And also below on this uh, website on YouTube, you can see where you can go to, uh, to, to purchase this if you're interested. So in our, in our next lecture, we'll go into more detail on the conflict between al Haj Omar and Amadou Amadou or between um, Tukuler Tijaniya who come in now to central Mali from the Futa area with the Messina Fulani or Pul who are Kadria. In, uh, in central Mali.